When Zen came to, she was floating, weightless, in a very dark place that smelled of animal. She hurt all over. Every breath pulled in bits of drifting dirt and debris. She spit out a long piece of straw, and the next second, something unseen closed around her wrist in a powerful grip. Reacting in blind panic, she flailed, twisting in the air. She broke free and kicked away from whatever it was, brought her arms up in front of herself, fists balled, ready to fend the thing off if it came at her again. Uh, I'm Christian Schoen. I'm originally from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I grew up in Minnesota. And then I was, I guess, what you'd call a General Motors brat. My father was an executive with General Motors. And so we ended up being moved all around the country because of that. Uh, Detroit, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, New York City. And then he finally decided that what he really wanted to do was to take over his father's car dealership in Laverne, Minnesota, a little town of 5,000 southwest corner. And so he, uh, he came back and, and uh, uh, bought out his dad's uh, GMC dealership and sold cars for the rest of his life. Um, and he was a very good salesman. He was, he was a, and he was a great guy. He was a, he was a, a wonderful talker, had a great sense of humor. Um, I didn't get to know him nearly, nearly well enough in the time that I had with him, but uh, Warren Schoen was a, was a great guy. And my mother, Betty Schoen, was an English teacher, and she is probably responsible for, for me getting into writing, I think. Uh, uh, our house was full of books always. We were, all the kids, all five of us, were encouraged to read all the time and, and read a lot. Um, so. Uh, that kind of got me started just uh, in literature in general and then I ended up uh, after graduating with a journalism degree went to California and there I, I got hired at uh, the Disney Studios as a copywriter worked for a few years in-house there wrote some scripts uh, uh, direct video stuff for Disney and then I started freelancing and, and wrote uh, marketing copy as well as a lot of scripts for teen and, and, uh, and younger television shows and did that for a little over 10 years and decided to move back to Iowa and now we're here. The most recent book and the one that we're launching today here at Prairie Lights and thank you to Prairie Lights uh, of course what a great institution uh, uh, the new book is called Under Nameless Stars and it's the second book in the Zen Scarlet series of young adult science fiction titles. Probably how did you pick an exo-veterinarian as your, as your heroine of, of your books? Uh, it's, it's something that most people say they've never seen before and I'd never seen it before. I've read a fair amount of science fiction and I'd never run across a, uh, especially a main character who's an exo-veterinarian or a veterinarian who works on alien life forms. And because my wife and I, when we came back to Iowa, had ended up volunteering with lots of animal welfare groups and ended up uh, like fostering horses, rescued horses on our farm and worked with a veterinarian who worked with exotic animals. We've had black bears on the farm. We've had full-grown mountain lions, uh, creatures like that that you don't get to see in Iowa a lot. And to get up close to those animals and to also uh, work with the veterinarians who worked on the animals. And that kind of combined with just my lifelong science fiction geekness. And, and uh, so that turned into Zen Scarlet being an exo-veterinarian novice studying uh, to get her, her, uh, her license basically as an exo-veterinarian. The quiet place I guess and yeah I, I do require quiet pretty much I don't have any music on or, or anything going on really usually when I'm when I'm writing uh, books uh, if I'm doing other writing uh, you know like blogging or something like that I can have like, classical music maybe in the background that doesn't have any any words or lyrics to it because those would distract me. Um, but when I'm writing, you know, the Zen books, for instance, I, it's quiet and I have an office at home in the old farmhouse that we have. And it's uh, remarkably quiet because the old farmhouse where my office is, that part of the house uh, was a brick four square. And so the walls are almost two feet thick brick. Uh, it was built around 1870 and they built them that way then. And you can't hear a uh, you know, a, a jet engine going over the house uh, uh, when you're in that room. So it's super quiet, which is great, actually. I, I love it. It's, a, it's the perfect writing environment for me. Probably a, like a busy cafe. Like I probably wouldn't come here to Prairie Lights to write in their cafe. I know a lot of people bring their laptops and like to do that or go to Starbucks or wherever. And that would be a, the worst place for me to write. I'd be distracted. I'd be people watching all the time. I wouldn't be able to focus. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm better off if there aren't any bright objects anywhere in my line of vision pretty much. Um, probably just hanging out with the animals on, on the farm. You know, take a walk, uh, interact with the horses a little, uh, uh, go check on the barn cats of which we have, you know, probably 
I don't know, 18 right now, and then another an indeterminate number of cats in the house. My wife doesn't allow me to say how many cats we keep in the house. But I'll interact with the cats. I've got some ferrets in my office, and they run loose uh, during the day. I let them out, and they run around, and then at night they go back into their cages, and so they keep me company. And, and so I probably get a lot, of, uh, you know, a lot of quiet time with animals as well. I, I think I'd, in a lot of ways I'd point to Douglas Adams as far as a science fiction author, even though my books are nothing at all like his. His were, were pretty much science fantasy, I think you would call them, with, with science fictional elements and were obviously comic, and he's a genius. Um, but I really admired just the way that he structured his introduction of, say, unusual or exotic or alien life forms. He'd do it in a very matter-of-fact way. I, and I really liked that about Douglas Adams. He didn't, there wasn't a lot of hand-waving about uh, something being outrageous when it totally was. But he just, he wouldn't, he wouldn't talk about it that way. He'd talk about it like, oh, you've probably heard about this creature before. I'm just going to remind you the details of its physiology and, and uh, you know, social habits. It was that kind of thing. And I, and I think that probably osmosed into me at a fairly early age. And, and uh, so I might, have, I might have drawn on Douglas Adams a little bit, I think. Um, the, the last book, uh, Under Nameless Stars, I went through and I tried to thin out the, all the times I used all right. Um, and there were two reasons for this. I use all right, A-L-L -L, space R-I-G-H-T. I use that a lot. My English editor refused to accept that and would always change it to A-L-R-I-G-H-T, all right, which I don't view as a word even. And after going back and forth with the editor a few times on this, I finally just said, fine, I'll just, I'll take it out. I, I won't use it nearly as much as I do, and maybe she'll leave it alone where it was. And I think that worked, basically. And it was, and actually, it was something that I overused anyway, and, and someone else had once commented on that. And so, yeah, I went back and, and thinned that out. <laughs> Oh, there's, there's probably plenty since I've only written, I mean, my only two novels are the Zen Scarlet books. Other than that, I've written a number of TV scripts and, and uh, uh, endeavors like that. Um, and yeah, they're the, I'm kind of interested in the steampunk genre. I find that for some reason appeals to me. I'm a bit of a maker. I like to, to work with my hands and build things and, and do a, not quite cosplay. I'm, I'm not quite a cosplayer that goes to conventions and does that. But I did it once because I was reading and, and doing a Zen Scarlet thing at Icon up in Cedar Rapids. And so I went ahead and, and uh, the, the steampunk costume I'd made for, for Halloween, I'd, I wore to the convention. And I had such a good time doing that and, and got into such great conversations with people about costuming and, and the maker movement and things like that, that that kind of tilted me more. And I said, well, God, it'd be, it'd be fun to learn more about steampunk and the whole genre and maybe, maybe do something in that genre. And so that's one project that's kind of competing for time in my head right now. For me, it was, it, was, it was getting over the fear of writing a novel, since everything I'd done in my life had been really short form before. When I worked at Disney, I, you know, I might have, have done a half hour script about you know, making a Mickey's Christmas Carol video. Well, that's half an hour. That's, you know, at, at max, that's 45 pages. Um, otherwise, I was writing back of DVD box summaries of movies. That's 200 words tops. Um, so it was all short form, and, and all of my stuff was, was like that. was like movie trailers, a minute long, maybe. Uh, maybe a minute and a half. And so when I sat down and was looking at a 300 page, you know, mountain of words, uh, that was kind of intimidating to me. So for me, coming from my background of, of kind of shotgun uh, uh, writing, th this was really an endurance race for me. And that was, that was tough to overcome, was, was probably the main thing. I just had to make myself sit down and start and, and get over that, that little phobia. Oh, I'm sure for some people it's, it, it's very much that way. Uh, uh, for me, it, it's, it's probably more nuts and bolts. I'm probably more of a craftsman who, who wants to craft my narrative and, and make sure the story arc is correct and pay more attention to environment and setting. And, uh, and Zen has her own ideas about that, and that comes out in the Zen Scarlet book. She's very much a scientist. And, and I, I lean that way. I wrote for a med school paper. I, my minors in school were all science minors, anthropologies and, and astronomy. Um, and so I think I lean more that way. When I, when I view the world and, and when, I, when I think about writing about my point of view on things, I think I approach it from much more of a, of a street level scientific uh, approach rather than overtly spiritual. Well, um, that's a, that is a, that's kind of a tough one. I, I guess, you know, uh, 
the stock answer for a writer to give about that, I think, from, from most writers' points of view, is that it's a person that, that tells a story or has even has information to communicate and then puts their butt in a chair and sits down and writes it and completes it. I think for me, that's what determines a writer is whatever project you're working on. You're not halfway through and telling people how it's great that you're writing such and such, uh, but you got to finish what you're working on. You've got, you need to have a finished product. I think that then makes you, in quotes, a writer. But it's, I think it's storytelling. I think that at root, that's, that's probably it. And human beings are hardwired to tell stories. I mean, that's our evolutionary past. That's as, you know, if you're, a, if you're a chimpanzee or an Australopithecus and you're looking at the alpha male over there, and if you can figure out what's going on in his head, that's something humans got to be really good at, and that made us conquer the world, basically, is that we could, we could look at that other guy, that alpha male or, or that female or whoever, and, and figure out what they were going to do next and how that would benefit us or how it would benefit our troop. Um, and when you do that, then you're telling stories right there. You're, you're, you're looking at them and you're projecting their actions into the future pretty much. You've got a story arc. You're the hero. Uh, maybe they're the villain, maybe not. Uh, maybe they're the mate. Um, but you've got the story arc. That's how that started us doing that. And now it's built into all of us. So anybody, anybody can draw that out. We're all, we're all wired up to tell those kinds of stories, I think. And I think there are archetypal storylines built into us because of our evolutionary past that way. At least that's, you know, from my amateur scientist point of view, that's, that's what I'd say about it.